Joining us now on our WTMY Artist Spotlight, we're going to be talking about uh, Frank Sinatra, of course, his 100th centennial coming up uh, later this year in December. And the man has written a very interesting book about Frank Sinatra. It's called Sinatra's Century, 100 Notes on the Man and His World. We're joined today by David Lehman from up in uh, upstate New York today as we talk to him on the telephone. And David, good to talk with you. How are you? Great. Good to talk to you. Yeah, I had a chance to, to read through the book. And uh, when we heard uh, the book was available, I wanted to have you on because uh, we play a lot of uh, of course, Frank's music at WTMY. We we run the Sid uh, Mark show. I know you talk about Sid in, in the book. So a lot of Sinatra fans down here in uh, Sarasota, Bradenton, and St. Petersburg. You got a lot of people interested in Frank. Well, uh, glad to hear it. Uh, he, he is the greatest singer, and uh, and I don't say that to put down the other uh, great male vocalists and female vocalists of, of that period. But I, I do think he's number one. I think uh, I think Bing Crosby probably the, for the first uh, half of the 20th century, and then uh, maybe Frank came in uh, midway through that. I guess they, you could say one and 1A, but Sinatra seems to have more of the emotional uh, uh, appeal, uh, even more than Bing did, right, for popular music? Well, I, I agree with that. I, I think Sinatra could sing a song of great passion, uh, of love, uh, yearning, desire, and loss. I'm not sure uh, Bing would do that as well. Right. Uh, mind you, I have the highest respect for uh, Bing Crosby, and I love the duets that Bing and Frank did together, not only in high society where they sing, Well, Did You Ever, which uh, <laughs> was a tremendous number of, by Cole Porter, but uh, uh, Bing had a television program in the 50s, and Sinatra joined him, and they sang uh, a medley of three songs, Among My Souvenirs, September Song, and As Time Goes By, and it's, it's just great, because Bing has a terrific uh, low uh, range and Sinatra a terrific high range so they have harmonized perfectly and uh, you know it's, it's, it's sort of wonderful that these guys who are utter rivals also you know really got along quite well. Did you ever see that they did a, another special I think it might have been one of Frank Sinatra's if not a special than one of his uh, series where it was Bing, Frank and Dean Martin together I think Mitzi Gaynor was on it I've seen that several times that's a great show. Yes that's right and also Bing was in the uh, Rat Pack movie they did called Robin and the Seven. That's right. <laughs> and they do uh, You've Got Style. That's the, that's the big yeah, number on that. Right. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. Dean, Frank, and Bing do <laughs> uh, a hat's not a hat till it's tilted. That's right. A flower's not a flower <laughs> if it's wilted. Yes, you've either got or you haven't got style. <laughs> Well, yeah, that's a great Rat Pack song. I guess they must have done it in their act uh, after that. But uh, that, that's, that's uh, they, they, you could tell they were having fun together. Now, I know that movie you talk about it in the book was made at a tough time, obviously, because it was right during the Kennedy assassination and Frank uh, Jr. getting uh, the kidnapping, that whole thing. You talk about that in the book as well. So Frank had a lot going on then. Yes, that was, uh, I think the joy was taken out of the project when the president was assassinated. Uh, it's uh, very curious. The um, Manchurian candidate came out, I think, uh, earlier that year, and Sinatra, uh, that's his last really great dramatic role in a movie, and uh, the movie centers on the assassination of a president or presidential candidate, and uh, people were very leery about making the movie, and it took a phone call from Sinatra to JFK to make sure that you know, it was okay to go ahead with adapting Richard Condon's novel into a, a really terrific film with Lawrence Harvey and Angela Lansbury and Janet Leigh. And uh, so it was sort of a little spooky that uh, that film came out and, uh, of course, the assassination of JFK on November 22nd. And then, in short order, Frank Jr. was snatched. That was a strange... Uh story. I saw they did a documentary or something on it not too long ago, well, maybe a few years ago now, where uh, they interviewed, I guess, the, one of the guys that was the kidnapper. And uh, still, I guess, some question whether that was uh, legitimate or whether it was uh, all staged, right? Well, in the defense uh, that the kidnappers mounted, their defense attorney uh, advanced the argument that it was a hoax, a setup, and that it was staged for publicity. And uh, I never bought that argument because, uh, as Sinatra says, this family really, you know, doesn't need publicity. Right. And uh, not of that kind, uh, certainly. 
and uh, I just don't believe it. I'm much more inclined to think of a conspiracy in which, uh, if you're a conspiracy theorist and you don't think Lee Harvey Oswald acted alone, the chances are you think that the uh, mob was involved to an extent, among other groups. If your mind goes in that direction, I think the uh, kidnapping of Frank Jr. might have been know, a little warning sign to Frank because uh, uh, Sam Giancana was furious with him. Uh, Sam Giancana was the mafia boss in Chicago and had, had a lot of uh, power, a lot of clout. And it's no secret that the mob helped elect JFK mm -hmm. in 1960. They helped uh, get West Virginia in the primary and they got him over the top of the election in Illinois. And they thought that the uh, Kennedy administration would go easy on them as a result. And they weren't uh, prepared for Robert F. Kennedy's uh, very vigorous uh, attempt to uh, uh, get the mafia broken. So uh, I think that uh, Sam Giancana was angry with uh, Sinatra because he had thought Sinatra was sort of conduit who is going to make peace between the national administration and the uh, underground. It didn't quite work out that way. It is said that Sam Giancana was going to arrange a hit on Sinatra, except that he decided that he wanted to hear him sing Chicago. That's right. <laughs> I saw that in the book. <laughs> well, there's always been that, uh, you know, connection. Uh, people, comedians always made jokes about Frank over the years of having those connections, and, and it was true to some extent about all those uh, entertainers back then, because a lot of the nightclubs were owned by uh, those guys. Right, the, the mob guys, or at least they had control over it somehow, didn't they? Well, if you begin with speakeasies, when uh, prohibition is going on, um, by definition, anyone involved in distributing, serving, uh, uh, transporting alcohol is breaking the law. So every every speakeasy is uh, an underground uh, uh, organization, and when it, it becomes legal. That doesn't mean that the uh, uh, criminal element is suddenly uh, evaporated. It just means that you have front men at the uh, Copacabana or <laughs> this nightclub or that nightclub. And so if you were in show business, if you were a comedian or a uh, singer, the chances are you met some pretty shady characters that was part of your life. And Las Vegas was, was built by those guys back in the 40s. <laughs> oh, yes, uh, Benny Siegel. Yeah. It was his vision of Las Vegas, and uh, he's the uh, model for Mo Green and the Godfather. Right, right, yeah. Yeah, so those those guys always had a, a hand in, like you said, nightclubs and, and uh, I guess the, you know, the, the liquor industry at that time. So uh, they uh, they had a hand in it, and, and they they liked you know Dean Martin and uh, Sinatra and all those guys to come entertain. So that they had to be nice to them. I mean, the singers had to be friendly to them too. So you almost had to be uh, associated, right? I think Frank and Dean and Sammy and the rest did, did a bunch of shows in Chicago without getting paid as a, you know, a tribute to uh, the uh, mob bosses there. <laughs> and of course they agreed to do you know, a lot of stuff in Las Vegas. And you know, Sinatra was a magic name. And uh, once he was associated with Las Vegas, why the Sands Hotel did not suffer in, in, in clientele. I mean, they, he brought lots and lots of uh, people out to Las Vegas and there was a boom and a revival of Las Vegas, which had fallen on sort of harder times. Let's go back to uh, the early days of Frank, and, and his life, in a sense, really has two parts to it. Uh, you know, the, the early band years, Harry James, Tommy Dorsey, and then uh, the Bobby Soxers, and then, then he just really fell on hard times, which is kind of hard to believe now. You talk about it in the book, how, how he was almost uh, pre you know, pretty much out of show business, and then uh, from here to eternity, I guess, was the turning point to get back in, right? Yes. Uh, uh, the uh, wild swings in his career are matched only by the volatility and wild uh, streaks in his personality. 
they described himself as an 18 karat manic depressive who, you know, climbed heights and then went to depths of despair. And his, his career sort of mirrors that. He had a meteoric rise. He was uh, wonderful with the Harry James band. He did this great song, All or Nothing at All, on August 31, 1939. And after about four or five months with uh, Harry James, which was a, a terrific band, but it wasn't as well known as the Tommy Dorsey band. And Tommy uh, wanted to woo Sinatra away, and he made him an, uh, a better offer. And Sinatra sang with uh, the Dorsey band, which was a uh, terrific bunch of musicians. They had a great drummer, Buddy Rich. They had the Pied Piper singing group, anchored by Joe Stafford. Uh, and uh, and uh, you can listen to the Dorsey uh, cuts that, that feature Sinatra to this day. They're uh, they're swell, like uh, Oh Look at Me Now, yeah. or I'll Never Smile Again, or I'll Be Seeing You, or How About You. Those are wonderful songs. The arrangements are very very good. But uh, he did. And, and he had to uh, pu pull a little bit of a, a power play to get out of his uh, contract with Tommy Dorsey, right? <laughs> <laughs> yes, and that too, like so many elements in Sinatra's life, that too has been fictionalized because the entire character of Johnny Fontaine in The Godfather seems to be inspired by Sinatra. And in fact, I think the very first mention of this famous phrase in The Godfather, uh, I'll make him an offer he cannot refuse, is used in the context of getting Johnny Fontaine the Hollywood part that he uh, desperately wanted to turn around his career, and uh, Al Pacino playing Michael Corleone tells his girlfriend, played by Diane Keaton, that, uh, that Johnny got out of his contract with the band leader because uh, Luca Brazzi held a gun to the band leader's head and said, either your, your signature or your brains will be on this uh, piece of paper. <laughs> But I, I don't know how, uh, uh, you know, these things are always fictionalized, and uh, if you're Sinatra, you probably don't, well, he, he, he disliked a lot of the mythology around him, but he contributed to it, and he was uh, certainly an extraordinarily charismatic character about whom legends would develop. Uh, but some of his best singing was done in the 1940s, the Columbia years, right. when he set out on his own. He, he was just terrific. Uh, I, I think I've played uh, uh, songs from each era, and uh, when he you know, sings songs like uh, Body and Soul, where the song is you, or where or when, uh, it's perfect. These are uh, the most outstanding versions of some of these jazz standards. You talk about the uh, the, the legendary uh, lifestyle, the women in his life. I mean, that's that's been uh, pretty well documented. Uh, Ava Gardner, I guess, was the one uh, one that uh, the, that was was the best one, I guess, for him. Right? There's so much alike, though. They were volatile when they were together, but uh, it didn't never worked out right. But that's the one he uh, longed for all the time, wasn't it? Well, I I think that she was the great love of his life, and, and apparently they fought like uh, well. cats and dogs. And then they had the greatest makeup sex in the world. <laughs> and uh, but they, uh, it's very hard to sustain a relationship like that. And also, she was, I suppose, his mirror image because she was a lusty gal, and she would have affairs with matadors or big game hunters or other leading men. And uh, it really got to Frank. And there are those like Nelson Riddle, the great arranger in the capital years of the 1950s, who say that Ava and the experience of uh, losing her, of uh, despair, uh, was one of the significant factors in changing his approach to singing. And the ballads in the 50s yeah. are tremendously moving, much more than the, uh, those of the Columbia years. Because one feels listening to them that here's a man who, who's acquainted with defeat and loss and losing. And it's so, um, such a great paradox that uh, Sinatra, who can sing, I've got the world on a string and make you feel it and make you feel that he really knows what it's like to be in, in, in a state of peace.
pure elation could also make you feel the absolute desolation of a man at a bar at a quarter to three in the morning who is spilling his guts out to the bartender. It's a, a, quite extraordinary. Yeah, some of his best work was done when he was probably almost depressed, almost despondent, wasn't it? I mean, some of those ballads or torch songs. Uh, that, I mean, that he poured it out. He poured everything into those records, and you could hear it. Yes, you, can, you, can, you can't fake it. And uh, he was a perfectionist when it came to recording, uh, so that, uh, you know, a great Sinatra cut like I've Got You Under My Skin, he would do 22 takes before he was satisfied with one. Mm. And uh, I think that he was able to tap into the emotion when he sang a song like Angel Eyes, let's say. Uh, he could, like a method actor, get into the part. So he's singing the song, but he makes it seem as if the song is a chapter of his own autobiography. Yeah. You mentioned... Uh you know, the Rat Pack, and we were talking before we went on, uh, I've had a chance to get to know uh, Dina Martin quite well, uh, Dean Martin's daughter, and then Dean and Frank were were almost like brothers. I'm not sure if Dean was as close to Frank as Frank was to Dean. Uh, I think Dean was more aloof, but uh, you know, what, what do you think about that friendship? How close were they? Uh, Dean was about the only guy that could tell Frank no, right? <laughs> yeah, well, Dean was really special uh, in that way, and he also was a natural comedian. Right. Uh, Sinatra was, couldn't really tell a joke. Pe people laughed when Frank, you know, did his best to make a jest on stage because out of you know, out of fear, <laughs> <laughs> either out of fear or out of love. Uh, but uh, he couldn't really tell a joke. But Dean Martin was effortless at it. I mean, he was, uh, had a, had this tremendous uh, gift for irony, and he was one of the greatest straight men who ever yeah. uh, uh, performed. So the two of them, I think, were very close. I, I, I also believe that uh, Dean Martin was in a very bad way after he and Jerry Lewis broke up their act because he owed a lot of money and. Uh, and everyone thought he was washed up, and uh, uh, in a kind of eerie echo of the Sinatra comeback with From Here to Eternity, uh, Dean Martin got into, uh, uh, some came running, and, um, and also uh, another uh, war movie. The, uh, the Young Lions, wasn't that it? The Young Lions, yeah. that's it. And, but Frank really helped uh, Dean with his career at that point. He had him on his television show. He got him the part in Some Came Running. And, uh, and they, you know, buddied up. And, and Sinatra was, you know, at that time, you know, very, very big. And so his support of Dean Martin helped him a great deal. Uh, as Dean carved out an incredibly great career for himself with uh, uh, a top song, Everybody Loves Somebody, uh, and his uh, television show. I love Dina Martin's book about her dad, by the way. Yeah. It's a, a terrific Great uh, book. Read. Yes, uh, full of wonderful anecdotes. And uh, yes, uh, I think Sinatra wanted to just stay up all night, and Dean wanted to go to bed. Don't you want to get up and play golf? <laughs> they're, they're, in some ways, they were totally different. Uh, but there was great chemistry between them. Do you think Frank, I mean, you mentioned it before, he even called himself a uh, uh, you know, manic depressive, 18-carat manic depressive. I've heard his daughter say that in interviews. Uh, I, it strikes me that he was never really a happy man. He never wanted to go to sleep, right? He never liked to be alone either. So he always had that people around him. I think he was in a natural state of agitation all the time. Yeah. Uh, you know, one thing one has to remember with uh, Sinatra is that from the time he was about 20 four years old, he never knew what it was like to be an ordinary person. That is, uh, when the Bobby Soxers went crazy for him, he needed to have a bodyguard, and he needed sometimes police protection. And uh, he would need to know the back exit uh, uh, of a theater. So he, he didn't know what it was like to be a normal human being. Uh, and uh, that's interesting fact and you you know you add that to uh, uh, having been having a mother who alternately doted on him and was very demanding uh, of him and you add to that his 
natural ability as a, as a singer and his great voice, and you get quite a package. Yeah, his parents alone. Yeah, you, the, the mother alone, you talk about in the book, and uh, she, she, she was a character in her own right. That's, that's another book right there, just her. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I, I think so. Uh, he, uh, it was an anecdote that I, touched me uh, a lot when he was dying, and he had somebody in the room with him at all times. He, he was saying, could you, he said to the uh, fellow, Tony, would you get my mother out of here? And his mother was, had been dead for 20 plus years yeah. at that point and uh, Tony says you know, I don't see her ever, her here uh, Mr. S and Frank said tell her to get out of here I, I can't get any sleep <laughs> <laughs> so she was a very living uh, presence in his life happy that's a good question I wonder how uh, Nancy would answer that question yeah. sort of the ultimate authority on her pop yeah, he, uh, he he did everything, uh, like you said in the song, his way. I mean, he smoked too much. He drank a lot. Uh, you know, he, he ran around with a lot of women and stayed up late all night, but he still lived to 83, so that's not too bad. <laughs> yes. Uh, I, uh, when you consider the way he led his life, it is remarkable. He wasn't very healthy. <laughs> Well, not a healthy lifestyle, but he, but he, he, now I know the last few years he wasn't in great shape, but still, I mean, he, uh, he, with all that smoking, the voice never really went away. I mean, the last few years it wasn't great, but I mean, uh, it's amazing. All those guys smoked, you know, Dean, Sammy, and all that, and, and they still sang pretty good. Well, you know, there was a time in, in America where, where everyone smoked, and yeah. if you look at the movies of the, you know, period, there's Humphrey Bogart smoking, or Betty Davis. And the cigarette is a prop. It's a great prop. It, it is a prop, uh, yeah. Those old Vegas thing, yeah. It, it does look, I, mean, I know it's bad for you, but it does look kind of cool <laughs> in that era. Yeah. And, and people like smoking. They like what nicotine did for you. And uh, so much so that after the Surgeon General came out with the warning in 1963, you know, people c continue to smoke in the face of uh, evidence of it, how harmful it was. Well, so you imagine Sinatra, you get a picture of him with a fedora tilted, with a uh, cigarette, with a trench coat. Uh, all of these are, in a way, props uh, and uh, marks of an identity and a great sense of fashion and style. Now, we were talking about the song, uh, you either got or you haven't got style and that's a uh, a real tip-off song because uh, Sinatra really had a, a sense of style in everything he did yeah the hat uh, he wore the hat Dean wore it they all wore it but uh, yeah, you don't see that anymore I, I miss those my dad wore a hat like that to work I mean uh, I, I love that look you know the hat and the, and the and the sport coat or the you know the blazer over the shoulder I still wear uh, I, I wear fedoras and in the summer, I wear uh, Panama hats. And, uh, I think a hat is a, a, a great thing for, for men. It's a great style accoutrement. And uh, one thing I notice in New York City, is when I wear a fedora, uh, men on the street uh, comment on the fedora. And uh, uh, there are very few articles of clothing that people feel confident about commenting on to a stranger right but uh, fedora gets uh, a lot of attention and, um, and and it should i uh, i think it's a pity that hats went out of style but i think they're coming back i hope so bow, yeah. bow ties are coming back i saw that too right right frank frank wore the bow tie at one time right back in the 40s well in the 40s <laughs> uh, he wore these particularly large floppy bow ties that his wife nancy uh, would uh, make for him to conceal his uh, prominent Adam's app. Right, right. Well, it's a great book, and we could talk uh, for hours about uh, Sinatra. Again, it's called Sinatra's Century, 100 Notes on the Man and His World. We've been talking with uh, David Lehman today. And uh, David, uh, I know you have a website. To give that out, people can uh, contact you and uh, get the book. Oh, yes. Well, our website is called uh, bestamericanpoetry.com. Uh, and if you go to www.bestamericanpoetry, 
uh, or just enter David Lehman in your uh, search engine, you'll, you'll get there. I, I'm the uh, series editor of this uh, annual anthology, The Best American Poetry, uh, which comes out every year in September, and I'm a poet. Um, that's one of the reasons that this book uh, on Frank took the shape it did. It's in a hundred parts so that each part could function as uh, an entity unto itself, almost like a non-fiction prose poem. And uh, I had a wonderful time writing this book, as you do when you act out of love. And uh, I've loved this music all my life, and I played it constantly while I was writing this book. It was just uh, a great experience. Well, it's, it's, it's really well done, and you really cover uh, really an entire life of Frank. And, uh, uh, David, really pleasure to talk to you. Hopefully we can do it again. Please keep in touch with us. I'll send you a link to, to this interview. You can uh, pass it along to your, to your website. But uh, please let us know if you have any future projects. Uh, love to have you back on again. But thanks for being with us today. Mm-hmm.